your um, attention. First, the color of no cases of Lyme disease is white. Do you see any white states? No. And that's kind of an important piece of information because so often Lyme disease is talked about as having a geographical kind of characteristic. And while there are hot spots geographically, this disease has been reported from every state in the nation. So hotspot up here in New England and the Atlantic states, the certain out east Florida, a little Texas, the upper Midwest is just abundantly populated and some California. So the green are the, the more uh, extreme areas, but there are no states at this point that have not reported cases of Lyme disease. The other thing I wanna draw your attention to is Maine. So in this 16 year period, Maine reported 12,472 cases of Lyme disease. In the three years since this data was active, the most recent data we have right now is 2019. They're still getting the 2020 data together. More than 6,000 additional cases have been reported. So half again as many in less than a quarter of time. Another way to look at this information. Um, here, I'm gonna move that there. Cases are increasing over time. And, you know, yes, there are dips here and there, but gradually we are seeing more and more cases of Lyme disease. And that's still just the tip of the iceberg. The other thing that you need to know about this information is that each case in these bar graphs represents a case that meets the CDC's surveillance case definition. That is very narrow criteria that we use in order to track a disease. That's not every clinical disease. And it gets even worse for tip of the iceberg because federal CDC acknowledged several years ago that the true number of cases probably exceeds the reported number and nationally that's around 40,000 each year by a factor of 10. And just this year, they released additional information indicating that there are probably 476,000 new cases of Lyme disease each year. And they based that on insurance data. So a half a million new cases each year, 10 times what is reported. So in Maine, was it 2000 cases or was it 20,000 cases in 2019? Well, we don't know. All right, gotta, when do you get Lyme? Well, it's happening right now. June, July, and August are the key months for Lyme disease. And that makes sense because that's the time of year when the nymphal tick, which is about the size of a poppy seed, is actively seeking its blood meal. When we go out to September, October, and November, you see another lump, um, little blip here. That's representative of the adult tick that might be about the size of a sesame seed seeking its blood meal. If it fails to get a blood meal during the fall, it winters over. And when temperatures are above freezing, it begins questing again. Now in Maine, most years above freezing begins to happen sometime in March. So we start to see cases rise again in April and May. But you may have noticed, and it's become quite clear that there are no longer any months of the year in which Lyme disease is not reported. This is national data, but Maine's is perfectly reflective of this. Lyme is an equal opportunity infector by age, zero to over 90, and pretty much by sex. There is a slight male predominance through most of the age groups, though in the over 65 group, we start to see women um, outrepresent men. In terms of ages, you can see it's a bimodal curve, this five to 14 year old area where it's a significant issue. And then in national data, 45 to 64, uh-oh. <laughs> but um, in Maine, the one interesting thing I need to tell you, and there are a few other states that are beginning to report this, 
the over 65 crowd is now outpacing the 45 to 64s. We don't have a good explanation for that yet. So no, you can never go outside again, right? But you live here. And if you live in Maine, you live someplace nestled into the woods with lots of water around you. And if you live here, you probably enjoy activities like this that take you into environments that are wooded and lush and wonderful. And I've been to Belfast Free Library before. And so I know you have all been on roads that look like this. And very importantly, you've been off these roads. If those things are true, you're at risk for Lyme disease. So what is it? Well, it's a multi-systemic bacterial infection that's spread by the bite of an infected tick. The bacteria that's responsible is a spirochete, that is a corkscrew-shaped bacteria named Borrelia burgdorferi. And what we know is that in its late or persistent infections, it may be much more complex and multifactorial. So here it is. This is what I was telling you. I'm sorry about the supper thing. This is the spirochete, Borrelia burgdorferi. It's actually a family of bacteria with species that cause disease in different parts of the world. In the US, the predominant cause is a bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi, are you ready for this? Sensu stricto. In Europe, there are three bacteria that are predominantly responsible and in other parts of the world, different. And along with those different bacteria are different ticks that carry them. We call it a zoonotic pathogen. What that means is that it's, it lives in animals and can infect humans, animals, and of course, ticks. The way it happens, is that a tick will feed on what we call a reservoir host, say like a white-footed mouse, which may be carrying the infection but not made sick by it. It then becomes infected and it takes one blood meal per life stage. So the next time it takes a blood meal, it has the opportunity to either pass that infection or acquire infection if it's feeding on another animal that can be infected. Once the tick is infected, it is always infected, and subsequent stages will also be infected. So people are an accidental host. I used to say that people are a dead-end host, but that's not perfectly true, because we know that in some instances, this bacteria can be spread by um, transplacental transmission, that is, to a, a fetus in utero, and we have had some experiments done where we have fed uninfected ticks on people who have had this infection and the ticks have become infected. We have no idea how often that might happen, but it can happen. And so I can't call it dead end anymore. I can only call it accidental. This bacteria is old and very adaptable. The oldest case of Lyme disease we know about was Tyrolean Iceman 5,300 years ago. And he had degenerative arthritis in his hip and the DNA of this bacteria there. This bacteria has had mul learned multiple ways to survive. Now let's talk ticks for just a minute. I want you to be able to have a couple of ways to recognize the ticks that put you at risk. This is the black-legged tick, the deer tick. Its science name is Ixodes scapularis. It's generally speaking small, either uniformly dark or two-toned like this. Now, there are probably 15 species that have been a species of tick that have been identified in Maine. People mostly come in contact with only two or three of them. And I'm gonna show you two of the most common, the deer tick, up top here, and here the dog tick. Now the dog tick is a little larger, but what you have to remember for me is that they have these lacy white markings on their backs, almost like racing stripes sometimes. That will help you to distinguish a dog tick from a deer tick. Now the third tick I'm going to show you is not common in Maine, at least not yet, but appears to be establishing itself here. 
and it's called the Lone Star Tick. Now this tick does not transmit Lyme disease. It does transmit a Lyme-like illness, but what I want you to notice about it is it is small. It is either uniformly dark or has this telltale white dot on its back. If you know this about these ticks, it will help you to identify them even once they engorge. Now, when you look over here, I wanna talk about size. This is the nymphal black-legged tick, about one millimeter in size. Here's the adult black-legged tick, maybe two, possibly three millimeters. Here's another look at the adult black-legged tick, but here is a fed and gorged black-legged tick. You can see that once they engorge, size becomes difficult to tell. In this example here, this side are the black-legged ticks, this side are the dog ticks. This is the larval stage. That's the first stage after they hatch out. You can barely even see that even in, you know, computer world. This is the nymphal stage, tip of a pencil, nymphal stage, period at the end of a sentence, poppy seed and the adult male and adult female. The adult female is larger, but this is an engorged adult female. These are um, dog ticks, male and female, and this is an engorged dog tick. You can see here that once they have engorged, using size to distinguish them doesn't help you, but I promise you what you will be able to see is whether they are uniformly dark or whether they have these lacy white markings or this special marking on them. So now you can be somewhat sure when you pull that tick off what it is. All right. So where do you find black-legged ticks? Well, brushy areas, even alongside the ocean. Uh, just had an article come out from um, California in which they identified the common finding of these black-legged ticks, in their case, Pacific ticks, Western black-legged, in the chaparrales near the ocean, just as common as in the higher range um, areas of Northern California. So brushy areas, the edge of the woods, rather than the deep woods, moist leaf litter, tall grass, wood piles, places where rodents go. How does this happen? Well, wait for this, these ticks, when they're questing are waiting on some vegetation for an unsuspecting victim to come along. They reach out, grab on, they find a place, they slice into your skin with these chelicerae. And then they insert this barbed mouth part into the wound that they form. And they feed by sucking a little and spitting a little. Did you get that? They slice in. Why don't you feel it? Well, because tick saliva is amazing. It contains a numbing substance. So the bite of this tick is indeed painless. It has a cement-like substance. Now, why do I tell you that? Well, this tick is so well anchored between the cement-like substance and the barbed mouthpieces that taking it out is difficult. You have to gently grasp as close to the skin as you can with fine nose tweezers and pull steady, gentle pressure straight up and it, the skin will tent and pop, it comes out with difficulty. And you need to know that so you don't give up. The tick saliva also has blood thinners. Well, it needs a good blood meal and immune suppressors. It downregulates the local immune system so your body doesn't reject it while it's trying to get its whole blood meal. Fascinating creature. Well, now you know how it happens, but what does Lyme disease look like? We usually talk about Lyme disease in stages. It's how we think of it. And early Lyme disease is identified as a rash, which we call erythema migrans, with or without flu-like symptoms. What may surprise you to discover is that the most common rash of Lyme disease is not the classic rash you've heard of, that bullseye classic rash. The most common rash is uniformly red and expanding. 
it usually has no symptoms. It can itch a little, it could be warm or raised, it might even burn a little, but most of the time you notice it because someone else tells you they see it on you. And in many people, it doesn't occur at all. It occurs around three to 30 days after the tick bite and very few people remember a tick. So most people who get Lyme disease never see the tick and then flu-like symptoms. So let's look at rashes. Here's the classic. This is the bullseye rash. If I had put that up first, everybody knows exactly what we're talking about. But I wanna show you this one as well. Look at that center. That doesn't look like typical. It's kind of excoriated there. And we've had them draw a ring around the outer limit of the rash to see if it's expanding. And lo and behold, we have other lines showing that indeed this rash did expand. Here's the more common rash though, uniformly red expanding rash. Sometimes you can see that little spot in the middle, the punctum where the tick had been attached, but not always. And look at this, this isn't anything like a round rash. This is kind of a trapezoid. Well, it follows the planes of the tissue. The rash expands along the planes of the tissue. And this is under a breast. Now this the appearance of this rash under a breast might make you think, huh, ah, could be a yeast rash. It doesn't itch. You guys are gonna be so good at rashes. I want you to see all the different kinds that we've seen with Lyme disease. So here's a rash located in a groin and look at this deep, deep red. That's the second most common is to have the center be a deep red. This rash, almost a bluish discoloration. And then it's got these, I don't know, crab-like extensions coming out. What this rash represents is the movement of the infection through the skin and your body's reaction to it. How about, oh, let's go back, see? Get ahead of myself. This rash is huge. It takes up the whole flank and right up under the armpit here, but look at this. We've got a blister right in the center. You might think that this was shingles, but it doesn't hurt. Shingles that looked like that would be very painful. On dark colored skin, it can take on a different appearance. Here, it kind of looks like ringworm. There's no flakiness in the center and it doesn't itch. Here on this dark skin, it looks like a bruise. And I wanna really mention that's behind the knee location, which is not an uncommon place to find the rash of Lyme disease. What else can happen back there? Oh, something like eczema. So it could easily be confused with some other skin conditions that happen. And finally, I wanna show you this rash. This is an angry red rash on someone's leg, just about full circumference, right? Looks like Cellulitis, really. You've, you've heard of cellulitis, a skin infection. What's important about this for you to know is that the first line antibiotic we use to treat the skin infection called cellulitis does not treat Lyme disease. So you need to remember where you've been, what you've been doing, so that you can alert your healthcare provider. We can use an antibiotic that would treat both. So does the Lyme rash have to be five centimeters to be Lyme? Well, to be counted in those bar graphs that I showed you at the beginning, yes, five centimeters is the cutoff. For the purpose of treating someone, well, let me show you. This is less than five centimeters. This was a day after a known tick bite. This is a two centimeter rash. The next day it was expanding and taking on that bullseye appearance. So no, for the purposes of treatment, it does not have to be five centimeters. And years later, same child has this rash. You do not get immunity to this one. You can get Lyme disease again and again. I know rashes, but just a couple more. Look at this one with me. Look how subtle that is. That's just a blush on someone's belly. Or this one, just a rim, a ring, like the one one of my family members had. 
or even this rash. If that looks like maybe a chafing at the waistband, each of these is biopsy proven erythema migraines. But it makes it so that when you look at the data nationally, this 70% of people who have definite Lyme disease report a rash. It makes sense that they may have missed it, doesn't it? Um, about 15% have a neurologic presentation, maybe 1% the heart, about 30% arthritis, but 70% have a rash. In Maine, the numbers are a little different. Years ago, it was the case that around 70% of the cases that were confirmed were associated with a rash. Over the last several years, you can see things have changed. So that at this point, fewer than 50% of people in Maine who have definite Lyme disease present with a rash. So my question for you, do you have to have a rash to have Lyme disease? No, not everyone gets or remembers a rash. So what might you have? Well, fatigue, that I can't take another step kind of fatigue, lethargy, malaise, headache, fever and chills, stiff neck, achy joints, achy muscles, a backache, lost appetite, sore throat, nausea, odd feelings or sensations in your extremities or your skin, vomiting, a few less common, abdominal pain, more common in children than in adults. The light hurts your eyes, hand stiffness, dizzy, cough, chest pain, ear pain, diarrhea. It's a head to toe kind of experience. Do you have to have all of these symptoms? No, but usually it would be some of them. You feel like you're getting the flu. So what can you do? Well, if you have a rash, particularly in high flu season, which we are coming into right now, high flu season, high tick season, forgive me, take a picture with a ruler for size, draw a ring around that rash and notice if it's expanding. Remember where you've been and what you've been doing. Um, is it possible you had a tick exposure? Then get yourself to your health care provider. The rash of Lyme disease is Lyme disease and needs a full three week course of antibiotic treatment. We do not recommend testing at this point because the testing will not be helpful, okay? Well, what if you have flu-like symptoms without a rash? What if in high tick season? It's the same story. Remember where you've been and what you've been doing. Is it possible you had a tick exposure? See your healthcare provider. We have no studies to tell us what to do in this circumstance, but experts recommend that in a suggestive clinical setting, that is flu-like symptoms without an other explanation in high tick season, we should treat exactly as we do for early Lyme with a rash. Okay, you ready? What if we miss that rash? What if you don't get a rash? Or what if your symptoms were so mild you never told anybody about them. Well, this disease can spread and it spreads through the bloodstream to other parts of the body. There can be skin manifestations. So you can have multiple skin rashes like we see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I think one over there. That was not six or seven ticks separately biting and creating this. This is a spread infection. And there can be some other late skin findings that are less common in the US. It can spread to the nervous system. Um, cranial nerve palsies, everybody's heard of Bell's palsy. That's a palsy of the seventh cranial nerve where you can't operate some of the muscles on that side, but it can be other nerves. You can have double vision, uh, difficulty swallowing, hoarseness. Um, it can involve nerve roots with pain, meningitis, inflammation of the lining of the brain, peripheral neuropathy, problems with cognition, memory, mood, and psychiatric symptoms, including depression, anxiety, even psychosis and mania have been described with Lyme. It can involve the heart, 
and every part of the heart. What we most often hear people talk about and what is part of the definition, the case definition for Lyme, are conduction abnormalities, heart block. But there are other things besides heart block that can happen. You can have rhythm disturbances, inflammation of the lining of the heart or the heart muscle itself. Carditis can happen, and there have been fatalities associated with this. The musculoskeletal system can be involved. 60% of untreated cases of Lyme disease go on to develop full arthritis, a painful red swollen joint. Um, and every part of the eye can be involved. Uh, inflammation from the conjunctiva on the most outer portion to the deepest portions, including the optic nerve. And there have been cases of blindness as a result. It can be a very big deal if we don't identify and treat early. So symptoms tend to come and go in late cases. Flu-like symptoms might be recurring. And if that happens, we should be concerned. We should take pay attention to that. That's not normal. Symptoms tend to occur in clusters. So fatigue with symptoms in the musculoskeletal system and the, or the neurologic system, that's what the hallmarks of late and persistent disease might be. Have, having a bad day now? Have I ruined it for you? Okay, it only gets worse from here. So just stick with me. So how do we make this diagnosis? Lyme, like pretty much all of medicine, is a clinical diagnosis. And what that means is we use the history, how the symptoms started, how they changed, whether there are patterns that are unusual. Um, and you have to pay attention because there are a lot of symptoms that overlap with other diseases and conditions. We do a careful physical exam. The symptoms and signs in Lyme disease can be quite subtle. And so you have to be alert to them. If you don't think it, you might not diagnose it. We have specific tests to do for tick-borne diseases. We also have tests for other illnesses that might look like Lyme. And then we see how people respond to treatment. Of course, testing is not simple. At this time, we do not have a laboratory test that is accurate enough to definitively rule Lyme in or rule it out. We long for one. For all of these years, that has been part of one of the most controversial aspects of this. What we use are indirect tests called serology, that is antibody tests, your body's response to the infection. And there can be false positives and false negatives. Now I'm a pretty simple thinker. What worries me most are the false negatives. In early disease, these tests are really not useful. I told you we, they're not indicated if you show up with your rash because you don't make an antibody response for two to six weeks after the infection starts. And we want to treat much earlier than that. In late disease, these antibody tests perform not equally well for every kind of manifestation. So they're much better for arthritis sensitivity of like 96%. Now that's not perfect, but it's incredibly good. On the other hand, for neurologic disease, the sensitivity is only about 72%. So we can miss about 30% of cases of Lyme if we depend on the test alone in neurologic disease. In fact, in the vaccine trials, they found that if they were relying solely on the serology test, they would have missed one third of the cases of Lyme disease in the most carefully scrutinized people so far on the planet. And then in persistent disease, so disease where you have had Lyme and it has been treated, but you have persisting symptoms, these tests can be extremely difficult to interpret because the antibodies may persist even though the disease itself is cured you're well, or the antibody response can wane even though you're still sick. And this has been demonstrated not only in human uh, cases, but also in animal models. So the long story short, 
tests can be supported, but they can't make the diagnosis for us. And that's probably true in all of medicine. And here's more complications, because it's not just Lyme disease, right? These ticks are able to carry other infectors that they can transmit to humans. Uh, the black-legged tick carries anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and Powassan virus. Um, and I include these so you can just see that the numbers have been increasing over time. Um, I include Powassan not because it's increasing over time, but because it's kind of a, an important infection to know about. Powassan is a neurologic virus. It um, attacks the nervous system, and it can be acquired in minutes rather than the hours or days that these other infections might require. This one probably in less than 24 hours. This one probably in at least 24 to 36 hours. So Powassan is the one that might make you really think it's important to keep ticks off of you. Um, this asterisk case in 2013 represents a fatal case. And even when it isn't fatal, people who have Powassan virus can be left with serious neurologic damage. So we have no treatment for it. It's best not to get it. This other infector I included here, Ehrlichia chaffiensis, I did for a particular reason. It is not carried by the same black-legged tick as the others. It's carried by that lone star tick, which has not been identified as firmly established yet. But you can see, although these numbers are small, they are clearly increasing at this point. And I, I tell you that because I want to bring it to your awareness. The tick that transmits this infection also has been responsible for red meat allergy. And so someone might have a very odd disease. And if we don't think of um, a tick-borne disease, we might never make that diagnosis. So it's not just Lyme. How do we diagnose Lyme? Or what do, we, what do we say? Well, if you have the rash of Lyme disease, erythema migrans, you have Lyme disease. You need full treatment. If you have the history and exam and lab that support the diagnosis of Lyme, it's probably Lyme. You need full treatment. Here's where it gets tough, when we're not sure. When things are complicated or we provide treatment, but you're not completely well, at that point, we have to consider not only Lyme disease, but could it be another of the tick-borne infections that might need different treatment or another associated infection? Could it be another kind of disease altogether, one of the collagen vascular disease, the inflammatory diseases, hypothyroidism, endocrine types of diseases, other infections that are not related to Lyme? So our goal is not to diagnose your Lyme disease. Our goal is to diagnose what your illness is and get you appropriately treated. How do we treat? Antibiotics. But that's not even easy. So the challenges in antibiotics, which one? There have been failures for every trial regimen ever tried. And people are all different. So we have to actually treat individuals one at a time. There's very little research to tell us what to do in combat uh, combinations of antibiotics, although sometimes that is a really desirable way to go, very little research to guide us. And how long do we treat? Well, as long as we have known about this infection, the duration of treatment really hasn't been well worked out. It varies by disease stage. Generally speaking, the, the sicker you are, the longer you might need treatment. And there are conflicting re recommendations given by very respectable groups. We have to consider the side effects of treating, and we also have to consider what happens if we don't treat. So it's kind of complicated. Is there any information that can help us to make these decisions? Well, it turns out there is some. First, we have to set our goal. What is our goal? To return to your pre-illness wellness. Now, I know that seems pretty obvious, but years ago in studies, that wasn't necessarily the end point of a study. It was something measurable in an objective way. There might be a disease-related um, marker 
for success, uh, clearing of the rash. But that's not useful because we actually know that the rash tends to go away whether or not the disease is cured. So return to pre-illness wellness. That's what people want. It turns out that when we look at some of the early studies of early Lyme disease, three weeks of antibiotics cured people 75% of the time. That's pretty good. I find that quite encouraging. The other important things we learned is that 10 days of an antibiotic was not as effective. The uh, cure rate fell into the 60% rather than the 75 or greater. Um, in those studies, if someone failed treatment, they were immediately retreated with another three weeks of antibiotics successfully. So good information to know. And finally, in the laboratory, they looked at, you know, in the test tubes, to decide, well, is it how much we give or is it how long we treat? It appears that how long we treat is more important than how much. Again, good information to know. So are there factors that can tell us who's likely to need a longer course of antibiotics? Well, in fact, when you read these, you can pull out some factors that do. If someone is very ill at the time of diagnosis, if someone has any neurologic symptoms at the time of diagnosis, if anyone has multiple rashes at the time of diagnosis, they are likely to need a longer course of antibiotics. Now that makes sense to me, and, and I'm going to tell you why. This suggests that the infection has already spread, very ill, neurologic, and multiple rashes. This is a disseminated infection. So it makes some sense that it would take longer to treat something that's spread through your body than something that is localized in one place, that single rash. And the, the last factor is kind of obvious too, I suppose. Someone who still has symptoms when they finish the course of antibiotics. Perhaps they need more. So with that in mind, here is a treatment guide. Okay. Um, this is my way of looking at it. It's a place to start. Everybody's treatment recommendations gives you a place from which to begin. So for the rash of Lyme disease, based on the information that we just talked about, three or four to six weeks of an antibiotic, because that's what seemed to work. If it's a spread infection, it needs longer. If it's a later persistent infection, probably needs longer in someone who's pretty acquainted with this. Antibiotic combinations, we don't have a lot of guidance on that, but they may be useful. And co-infections may need different antibiotics. Important to know these things. But of all this information, the most important thing on this slide is people need careful follow-up. That's the key to getting this right. It almost doesn't matter where you start with your antibiotic. I mean, it does a little because we know that you know three weeks is better than 10 days, but it almost doesn't matter where you start as long as there's follow-up and we assure that you return to your pre-illness wellness. People need to be individualized in their care, person-specific, patient-centered care. That's what our goal has to be. And that brings us to prevention. So, wait, the text. We forgot the text. This would have been perfect. <sighs> Didn't happen. So that ship has sailed. So now we have to rely on people. And the base of prevention for people is avoiding tick bites. I mean, I know that sounds obvious, but that is the base. The second level is prompt tick removal. If we remove it early, it may not have time to transmit infection. And the smallest part of our pyramid should be using preventive antibiotics. Okay, so how can people avoid tick bites? Personal protection. Avoid tick infested areas. I mean, when you can, that's a good idea. How about light colored clothes? They're dark colored ticks. You might recognize them outdoors while you're, you're still there. 
long sleeves, long pants, tuck your shirt into your pants, your pants into your socks. You create a barrier from the ground to your wrist. And you look kind of uh, stylish, like Maine's Game Wardens. How about we spray clothing and gear with permethrin? Permethrin has been found to be extremely useful on fabrics at preventing tick attachments. And in fact, it kills ticks. So if you treat your gear, your clothes with permethrin, not only will ticks die on contact, but so will mosquitoes. If you do it yourself, it will last through several washes. If you have a factory treat your clothes, it can last through 70 washes. Um, I included Insect Shield's name, um, not because they, they are providing a kickback, but because they are a company I know that will accept your own clothes and treat them. They also have lines of clothes you can purchase. There are other uh, places in Maine that also do that. Dog not gone over in Skowhegan. So take a look at the internet and find treated clothing. It works. The group in uh, University of Rhode Island um, that does the Tick Encounter website, which is a really good website, did a study and found, because they were interested in looking at summertime attire, where we don't want to wear long everything, if you treat only shoes and socks, 73 times less likely to have a tick attachment. This stuff works. And on your exposed skin, use EPA registered repellents. The registration means they have been looked at for safety and for efficacy. So it's prudent to, to get an EPA registered repellent. DEET is still the gold standard, at least 23%, less than that doesn't really work on ticks. Um, more than 50% probably doesn't do better. The secret to um, safe DEET use is wash it off after the adventure. We've got more than 60, must be five years now of safety and efficacy data on DEET and problems have arisen when people have used high concentrations in repeated applications over a lengthy period of time without washing it off. Simple thinker, wash it off when you're done. And never, never on the backs of children's hands, right? Right, never on the backs. IR3535 was developed to be comparable to DEET. It's a biologic and um, its claim to fame is you don't have to wash it off. Again, simple thinker, it's a chemical, wash it off. The keratin at 20% has been found to be as effective as DEET and in some studies more effective than DEET. What I would suggest with that, um, I guess I'm not suggesting it really, what I'm thinking and with the keratin is that people who have chemical sensitivities seem to tolerate this better. And finally, PMD, oil of lemon eucalyptus, at a concentration of 20 to 30 percent, is probably the only, um, quote, natural agent that has been EPA registered. Um, it is not oil of lemon and oil of eucalyptus. It's oil of lemon eucalyptus, or PMD, which is the synthesized agent. Um, tends to need more frequent applications, but not always. The EPA has a lovely website that I neglected to include, but I will look for and provide to the library, um, in which you can kind of type in your needs in terms of hours and which agents you might prefer to use, and they can give you agents that you can um, acquire. Um, what about uh, essential oils? I, I just feel you asking that. Um, we don't have data on essential oils. There are a couple that are uh, used at this time, undecanone, which is um, wild tomato. And uh, that is actually already on the market and probably has value. And nutcatone, which is um, derived from grapefruit skin and another source is yellow cedar, I think but that has not made it to market yet. Other essential oils may have benefit, but we have no studies. So I, I just don't have a way to tell you about that. Um, the thing that I have found is that typically they require more frequent application and with more frequent application, you run the risk of more skin irritation, so. Okay, next step, do a tick check when you finish your adventure. 
And by a check, I mean looking and feeling all over because these are tiny ticks. And while you may not see it, you might feel that bump. Showering within two hours of outdoor activity has been found to decrease tick attachments and um, subsequent disease. So shower within two hours, do a tick check. Remember the hot spots behind the knees and the groin at the waistband, in the bra line, the armpits behind the ears and in the scalp, okay? Looking for these ticks. Take your clothes and toss them in the dryer on high heat. Don't wash them first, toss them in the dryer on high heat. Six minutes, if they're dry, will kill ticks. If you wash them first, it takes more than 50 minutes to kill ticks. But again, it's an approach. And remember to check your pets, your companion animals, because they get Lyme too, and because they can bring ticks in to you or other folks who maybe don't enjoy the outdoors or don't spend as much time and might be unsuspecting uh, victims of this tick attachment. There are things you can also do for your property. Um, the, the global concept is to dry it out. Ticks like it moist, so dry out your property, and that can really be helpful. Um, reduce the tick-friendly stuff. Brush, leaf litter, get it away from the active yard areas. Wood piles, rock walls, rodents like those, get them away from the active yard areas. Bird feeders, now don't hurt me on this one. I enjoy feeding birds as much as anyone, but I want you to look at my photo here. One, two, three, four, five nymphal ticks engorged on this bird. So I found from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station um, uh, investigator Kirby Stafford suggests that it is safe to feed birds between October and April, because nymphal ticks will not be traveling on them at that point. Um, it will be, and adult ticks don't travel on them. So April to October, it's safe. If you continue to feed birds, simply don't feed them in the active yard areas. And that sort of defeats the purpose because we all want to watch them, but there. Remove ground covers that are found to harbor ticks, specifically things like, um, Japanese Barbary. Uh, I put this on here to show you a forest where there is Barbary and a forest where there isn't. I mean, I think it's an obvious um, tick harborer. It's low to the ground, it maintains moisture, it harbors rodents, rodents are a problem. So promote unfriendly yardscape. So grass mowed short, keep it dry. Put a three foot border around your property between you and the woods that discourages the transit onto your lawn. Um, various kinds of grasses and herbs that are either unfriendly for deer, um, but less likely to harbor um, ticks and rodents. If you consider spraying, there are proper ways to do it. I would encourage you to consult um, a professional applicator for that purpose. If you have a huge tick problem, get some help for that because we have a great watershed and we have wonderful pollinators and we want to do as much to protect those parts as we do to diminish the tick population. The last part is host management. So keeping deer off your property and there are things we can do for rodent control that if we have time at the end, maybe we can talk more about that. So here's a good looking yard, that three foot border the wood pile way back there into the woods, the swing set not next to the woods. Um, there are ways that we can do it. Well, you did the best you could and you tried very hard, but you still got a tick. Don't panic. What do we do now? Find tweezers, grab the tick as close to the skin as you can. Steady, gentle pressure. Look at that skin tent and pull straight out. If you use a tick scoop, a spoon with a V notch in it. Get the tick mouth parts into the notch. You might have to push the skin down and go straight across smoothly along the skin. It's important not to annoy the tick. Don't try the burnt match, no heat, no chemicals. Don't try to suffocate it. You really can't suffocate it. They don't need a lot of air. Um, and try not to break the tick open. Disinfect after you remove the tick. Why are we trying not to do this? 
because if we annoy the tick and it's only been feeding a short time, it may cause the tick to regurgitate. When the tick first starts to feed, the bacteria, the Lyme bacteria is located in its midgut most of the time, once in a while in the salivary glands, but most of the time in the midgut. It starts to reproduce, gets into the circulation up to the salivary glands and then is transmitted by suck a little, spit a little. If you cause this newly attached tick to regurgitate, you could take a very benign bite, very short duration bite and make it guilty by getting tick gut contents into the wound. Same if you break it open, gut contents may get into the wound. And then save the tick for identification and testing. Put it in a plastic bag if you want. The University of Maine Tick Lab offers a wonderful service. Um, they will identify the tick, give you the level of engorgement and do PCR testing for Borrelia burgdorferi, the agent of Lyme disease, for anaplasmosis and for Babesia, all for $15. It's an incredible bargain. If it's a dog tick, they, pardon me, will test it for um, Ehrlichia, for the spotted fever, um, Rickettsias, and they'll test it for uh, Tularemia. So a great service, definitely to be considered. So how do you decide if your bite is a risky bite? Basically, um, the infection rate of ticks times the time of attachment helps us to figure out how likely you are to have um, infection. Unfortunately, those are two things we hardly ever know. But what I wanna tell you about, I mean, we know generally how, what the infection rate is, but we don't know specifically at a given time because it can vary by quite a bit from place to place. So um, for Borrelia burgdorferi in the lab, this, these were mouse studies, at 24 hours, there's very little risk of infection, but it's not zero. There's about 100% likelihood of infection at 72 hours. I try to think of this as the longer it's attached, the more likely it is to transmit infection if it's carrying infection. So to treat or not to treat your bite, we have to individualize this. You don't want my general assessment of how likely it is you got it. How can we individualize it? Well, look at the tick. Was there any evidence of feeding? If there's any engorgement, that is, if this is not a flat tick, then it has been feeding long enough to transmit infection if it was carrying infection. How long do you think it was attached? Although people are notoriously bad at, at guessing that, they tend to underestimate, not overestimate. So the longer you think it was attached, the greater risk. Now, PCR positivity has been associated with a more likelihood of tick attachment, but we can't know that at the time that we're making this decision. The other feature we can know is, was the removal complicated? I mean, did you, did you have it in a million pieces or did it come out easily, a nice, happy tick at the end? So those are the things that we can know. The risks of treatment, well, you might react to an antibiotic. Maybe you're gonna get multiple bites, so we're gonna have you on antibiotic after antibiotic. You don't want to treat an uninfected tick bite, but that is a risk. And of course, the cost. How about the risks of non-treatment? Well, maybe you get Lyme disease that we could have prevented. Um, maybe you have another infection that could have responded to the antibiotic we use. And again, cost. So let's put this together. Preventive antibiotics for a high-risk bite, okay? Evidence of feeding, complicated removal, um, presumed longer attachment. The best option is probably doxycycline for 10 to 20 days. Now, this is not based on a specific study. The problem with all of this is we don't have well worked out studies for this. There are other options, but they're less useful. One of them is to use a single dose of doxycycline, 200 milligrams within, they say, 72 hours of tick attachment Though, if you look at some of the data, probably 48 hours would be wiser. Now, it may not be that effective. This is based on a single study. And in that study, they looked at its ability to prevent a rash at the site of the bite. 
but what do we now know about the occurrence of a rash? He may not get one. So that's not a good enough marker for Lyme disease because the later complications of Lyme disease don't show up at that point. So it claimed 80% or more efficacy, but a reanalysis thought it might be only about 50%. And well, that's not so bad. Is there a downside? Well, it can throw off the blood tests. If we treat with an antibiotic early but fail to get rid of the infection, we can turn off your body's immune response without getting you well. And so weeks later, when you show up ill, your blood tests may be negative. As long as everybody involved in treating you knows this, then you can make that decision. It's important to me that this be a decision you make with your healthcare provider. You really have to talk about this. So what are your other options? Well, how about wait and see? Well, that might be a reasonable thing to do. If you have a very short duration tick attachment, the uh, removal was perfect, you have a flat tick, that may be a very reasonable choice. But wait and see is not prevention, right? Wait and see is jumping on the very first sign or symptom and doing early treatment. It's not prevention. And remember again, there may be nothing to see. 30%, no rash. Regardless of whether you decide to take a preventive antibiotic or not, you need to write this down on your calendar and watch for rashes or symptoms that develop. How long? For at least four to six weeks after you've had a tick bite. And if you start to develop symptoms, let your doctor know right away. Well, there you go again. Every time I want to talk, you go and bury your head. Please don't on this one. Lyme disease is a potentially preventable infectious disease. And prevention is the level best. Early recognition, next best. Everything after that is more challenging. All of these amazing people and organizations contributed to this slide presentation. And I wanna thank Brenda and the Belfast Free Library for inviting me to share with you, patients and families who shared their experiences with me. And I wanna thank you for taking the time to come out. An ounce of prevention really is worth a pound of cure. And there we are, we're done. I'm going to stop sharing now and you're all gonna show up on the screen. Maybe. Well, thank you so much, B. That was very um, informative and always good to hear, even though I've heard it before. So we do have a... <laughs> I have, we do have a few interesting questions and um, I'm going to ask them of you now. Um, so Linda asked, are there any blood or urine tests that can detect that you, that you had Lyme disease in the past? Oh, that's a great question. Thanks for that. Sort of, how about sort of? Mm -hmm. So the blood tests that we have, the antibody tests that we do, are able to detect exposure, but are really not particularly good at telling us whether it's new or old. Um, there are two antibody tests, IgM, so immunoglobulin M, and IgG. IgM is usually thought of as an early marker for early disease. It's also considered an active marker. Um, different groups identify only the first month as being a time when it can be considered active disease. I'm not sure that that is a good approach, but many folks who treat will use that. IgG tells us about either the infection you have now or an infection from long ago, and we just don't know. It just tells us about exposure. So how do we use those? If you're sick and we have positive tests and your illness fits with the diagnosis of Lyme disease, then we'll probably assume it's active now. It, um, no single data point 
should make or unmake the diagnosis. It really is putting it all together, the whole picture that we should be using in, in making the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. There are some uh, urine tests that are up and coming that look at um, proteins from the bacteria. Um, there was one years ago that was really interesting, but is no longer available. But there are some now that are being looked at. Um, for some of the other infectors, PCR testing, sometimes in the urine, can be valuable in identifying the bacteria or the pyroplasm if it's Babesia. So it's, that's not a really good answer to your question, but it's the best that I have. Okay, thanks. Um, Ken asks, um, if you see a tick on your dog after removing the tick, what do you do? Well, great. Now, now you guys are much more expert in defining whether it is a deer tick or a dog tick. Um, you know, if it's a dog tick, you might not need to do anything, but you might consider sending it off and finding out what it's carrying. The hard part about tick testing, and I guess we'll talk about that now. You know, you send your tick in and they run this PCR testing and you know, it's important to know how sensitive and specific it is. And usually it's quite good at the university. But what if you are well, or your dog is well, and the tick has all kinds of infectors in it? I mean, you don't have that within the window for treating uh, prophylacting Lyme disease, but then dog ticks generally don't carry Lyme disease. Um, and we don't know anything about prophylaxing any of these other infections. We have no data, zero, zip, nothing. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Dog's well, tick is nasty. Remember the data so that if the dog turns up sick, you can provide the information to the vet. Um, it, when it's you, same thing. If you're well, but the tick is infected, we don't know what to do. But I think that we don't treat well people because what's your endpoint, right? What's your endpoint? Mm -hmm. if, um, if you're sick and the tick is negative, what do you do? You treat the person. You don't base it on what's in the tick because A, maybe the test wasn't that good that day. Two, maybe that wasn't the only tick. It's just the tick that you found. And of course, the other possibility is you got something else. Does that help? Well, that's your answer. So, um, this is an yeah. interest. This is an interesting question. This next one, um, uh, Terry asks: A friend plans to get pregnant. Both she and her husband are at high risk for Lyme and tick-borne diseases, but have not had symptoms. Should they be tested to see if they could be silent carriers? Wow, what a question! Um, yeah. If we had better tests, you might entertain that. But honestly, if they are well, despite you know a lifestyle that might put them at risk, we don't have good enough tests to give them information that will help them. Sorry. No, that's okay. I think if that's a great answer. Um, so that's the last of the questions in the chat. I did want to mention to everybody that B will be uh, the guest on Rhonda Feynman's um, talk show on WERU tomorrow called, uh, what's it called? Healthy Options at four o'clock tomorrow on WERU at 89.9. If you wanna tune in, you'll have the opportunity to hear some more. Um, and I invite anybody right now, if you have a question to please unmute and hopefully you won't all unmute at once and please go ahead and ask your question. If you have one, otherwise we can just say thank you. <laughs> there are a lot of people <laughs> thanking us for the program. So just so you know. Oh, entirely um, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the program, you know, thanks for the helpful information. So yeah, go ahead, B. Well, I was gonna say we did just, we really covered early Lyme and prevention. I mean, and, and that was my goal because we're, walking right into tick season at this point. There have been ticks around already. I'm sure some, some of you folks have seen them. I, I've had people call me about them. 
Um, but there are other things that if you would like to talk about them at some point, I would be happy to make um, myself available for a presentation on, on late Lyme and those other things. Okay. It's just, I have to tell you that my, my goal is to try to avoid late and chronic cases by preventing or recognizing it early because everything out there is, is much more challenging. Yeah. Doable, yes. all doable, just yes. more challenging. Yeah. Oh, we got another question in the chat. That's sure. interesting. Are multiple Lyme positives cumulative? So the more often you get it, the sicker you become. Great question uh -huh. to which I doubt there's a good answer. Interesting thing though. So I'll try and get that, but multiple tick bites. So if you have, and I'm not suggesting this as a technique, <laughs> but multiple tick bites have been associated with people developing kind of an immune response to tick bites, mm -hmm. which is exciting because if you sense the tick, or cause the tick to fall off before it has a chance to really deliver an infector, that's a great thing. So that, you know, I don't recommend that as the technique you use, but it has been shown and has become the basis for exploring a vaccine directed against tick saliva. Um, that's the vaccine I've wanted for years. The University of Rhode Island, my buds down there, we're working on it. I have not seen a oh. single word from them in a long time, but I, I long for that. I mean, there are other vaccines being talked about and some that are close to um, going to market actually, um, but it's the tick saliva vaccine that I think would be most helpful because there are so many agents that travel in the same tick. We could develop vaccines against all these agents, but my sense, and there are some folks who actually are working on that, mm -hmm. but my sense is that there will always be something else. So if we could keep the tick from attaching, that'd be golden. Yeah, absolutely. So meanwhile, you'd really have to do personal protection. So, so I do have a question. Yeah, my Oh, go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, but cumulative, cumulative experiences of Lyme. Nobody has really looked at that specifically. You know, presumably each time you become infected, it's probably a slightly different strain. And it really very much depends on your immune system and which strain of the infection you get that determines how severe or, or problematic the infection is, you know, um, for example, in Europe, Borrelia afzeli is the species that is most responsible for the rash of Lyme disease. Well, Borrelia afzeli does not tend to spread. So people tend not to get systemic Lyme. Mm -hmm. We are fortunate to have Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto, which spreads just fine but not all subspecies or strains spread equally fine. So it depends a lot on what you, what you get. So. so the question I was gonna ask B is, you know, given what we've seen with phenomenal vaccine development in the past year, how come we still don't have a vaccine for Lyme? I know there was one years ago. I know somebody who had it and they give it to dogs. Why don't we have one for humans? That's such a wonderful question. And a and, um, little bit of history. The vaccine that was developed years ago was outer surface protein A. Now, before that, there were dog vaccines that were kind of the whole organism chowdered up and so dogs got vaccines they responded to all those proteins it has its pluses and minuses but they used this outer surface protein a vaccine for people um, the way that it worked is it killed the bacteria inside the tick mm -hmm. because once the bacteria is not inside the tick guess what it doesn't produce outer surface protein a anymore it kind of transforms to a different outer surface protein. 
outer surface protein C. It's probably more complicated than that, but that's my way of explaining it. So you had to have a very high level of antibody all the time in order to have that vaccine be effective. An interesting way to do it. Mm -hmm. Now it was removed from market for poor sales, but the poor sales came because, oops, turns out outer surface protein A, at least a portion of it, cross reacts with human joints. Uh oh. And so some people were quite ill after receiving the vaccine. Now, um, it was removed from market. It, you know, okay. it, not the right choice. Now, there is currently work being done, and they've been through phase two trials already um, in Europe using a portion of outer surface protein A that does not cross react with human tissue. So that has some potential up and coming. More exciting than that is the one that has been developed by um, Marconi's lab for dogs, which is a combination of outer surface protein A, the part that doesn't cross react, and outer surface protein C. So not only will it act in the tick, but it may act in the creature um, what if some bacteria get through. That's looking like a good vaccine. It's an excellent dog vaccine. His lab is also working on vaccines for people. And I think at a conference in the fall, I may get to hear more about what he's doing. So I still want tick saliva. <laughs> so, and yeah, so there's the, why, why has it been so many years? And vaccine development is expensive. Uh, I mean, it is expensive to do. Um, with coronavirus and this new technology, which isn't that new, which started getting developed back in what, 2003, when the first coronavirus made its rounds. Um, it's brilliant. It is a brilliant delivery mm -hmm. system. This, uh, this messenger RNA thing, mm -hmm. one of the safest, and at this point, apparently most effective vaccines we've seen for anything. I would love to see somebody adopt that and you know, kind of walk it across the street to some Lyme research. But when you dump buckets of money in, things things happen fast. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so there's something we didn't talk about, but the people should be aware about too, is that COVID um, shares some symptoms with Lyme. And so remember what you've been doing, where you've been, if you become ill. Um, it looks like the numbers in Maine, probably nationwide, for Lyme disease will be much lower this past year than in years before. Is that because nobody went to the doctor? Is that because we had a bad tick year? I mean, some of those things are true. We'll find out. Or is that because some people went sick um, and were identified as coronavirus, not Lyme. Mm -hmm. So just remember where you've been, what you've been doing. If the possibility of tick exposure exists, uh, let your healthcare people know. All right, all right. Well, thank you so much, B. This has been really informative and I have had a couple requests to schedule you for a program and another time on advanced Lyme and treatment and things like that. Well, thank you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk, that, we'll talk. Yeah, to do all that in one sitting would have put us all to sleep. It would have been bad. Yeah. <laughs> so. so with that, thank you so much.